Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could teach the gullible to never be so comfortable with lies they eat like comfort food? To disregard the bogus claims and pseudo-scientific claims, can you imagine just how much indeed the world would change? No more political predators playing on the populace, but ilkus and plots to shift and kill metropolis. No more villains with the title in the Bible holding phony temper writers like the stuff they teach is vital. Imagine it was normal to have to prove a claim to me. The folks who really feel ashamed of pressing content that was fake. It's not to say we never make mistakes, it's just to say we go out of our way to show the evidence it takes. Remain skeptical while you travel the world or even stay trapped. We're allowed to get fast. That's what it is, yo. Yeah. Keep reality intact. Yeah. Tell health and truth, bro. Uh-huh. Question every claim, especially the ones you believe in. Remain skeptical while you travel the world or reason. Hi, I'm Rob Penzak. And I'm Rick Wingrove. Welcome. Welcome to Road to Reason, Skeptic's Guide, 21st Century. Uh, today we're going to be joined in a few minutes by Robin Blumner, the new Executive Director of the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Science and Reason. Uh, first we're going to start with some announcements and a little bit of news. So um, okay. I guess first we can issue an ongoing challenge to any atheists out there. If you have unsupported beliefs that aren't kind of based on skepticism and looking at a bunch of uh, facts, we would love to hear you call in and explain why you think homeopathic medicine is a good idea, why you think Bigfoot is real. We really want you to start applying the same skeptical thinking that you do to religion to all aspects of your life. Um, and, same and, thing. And if you uh, are a believer in God and uh, you feel like you can provide us sufficient reason to believe the same thing you do, please call in and uh, educate us. All right, now explain why you're skeptical about Thor and Odin and Zeus and every other god except for your own. And again, we want you to look inside and try to figure out why is it that you are thinking faith is a good thing um, as opposed to just believing in something that doesn't have enough facts to to support it. Uh, We also want to remind people out there that if you are able to give any donations sent toward uh, Fairfax Public Access toward our show, we'll put those to good use, help us uh, bring in people for interviews, and we promise to use that money wisely if you send it. Yeah, for things like new graphics and stuff. I see we've got all new graphics and a new song by Tombstone, The Dead Man. Right. Very nice. So, all right. um, what else? Got, We're also always yeah. looking for, if you noticed in our credits, a lot of dudes on this show. A lot of dudes. So, um, we're looking for uh, some women who can, uh, you know, act as hosts on the show. Okay. So. One other thing that I want to mention in the announcements is Linda Lascola and Daniel Dennett back in 2010 did a pivotal study called Preachers Who Are Not Believers, um, where they interviewed five pastors who no longer believed in the supernatural things that they'd been taught and had been preaching for all these years. Out of that experience came the Clergy Project, which Richard Dawkins, Daniel Dennett, Linda Lascola, and Dan Barden were behind, and also another study caught in the pulpit where they um, examined more people uh, than just those five with other denominations. More recently, just over the last couple of weeks, Linda Lascola started a blog called Rational Doubt, and that's letting people, just lay people, start to interact with that uh, community of ex-clergy. So we encourage you to take a look if you're interested, look up Rational Doubt, and uh, go join in that conversation. Go, yeah, go look at Clergy Project. It's a pretty amazing thing when you think about it, what this really is. Preachers who have found that they can no longer uh, sustain a belief in God, and yet they're trapped in the pulpit. It's an amazing thing. And there are, uh, I know they're well over 200 now. That's 200 a year ago. Right, and, and this is something. the site. And had, right, and as I say, this is important, not just for atheists to visit this site, or, and, or fundamentalists, but this is really a very broadly, uh, a very broad community could form here, where people are getting to interact with these clergy that a lot of them went into it with the best of intents. They did start applying some skeptical thinking as they learn more and more. And they really get trapped there in the pulpit. And it's really, you know, atheists need to take a look and empathize with these people because most of them didn't just go into it to make a lot of money and get a lot of power. And that's something that comes out and caught in the pulpit. Right. You know, this also has implications for the people in the, uh, the pews also. We know that, we know from talking to people that there are many people still sitting in pews who are there just out of momentum and social pressure. Right, Right. and that's part of, you know, as you start to delve into religion a little bit more, there's really two aspects. One is you want to look and see if there's good grounding for it, and the other is you want to look and see, does religion help everybody, cause harm, or somewhere in between? And if it causes a lot of harm, and there isn't a very good foundation for it, just drifting along through inertia isn't doing anybody any favors. And giving a lot of respect toward the whole idea of faith isn't doing any favors either. We really need to start thinking skeptically. Right. All right. Now, you were at American Atheist Convention recently. You wanted- the convention, actually, I uh, met our uh, guest today, Robin Blumner, there. She was working on the uh, 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 openly secular 
campaign, which will be starting later in the year. I'll let her talk about that when she's in here. Okay. Uh, but that was going on, and uh, the convention, if you weren't following or weren't familiar, was in Salt Lake City this year, or in the belly of the beast, as uh, we, as some people say. Yet you reemerged. You did make yeah, it out. Yeah, we uh, survived and uh, suffered very little uh, damage from it. Actually, it was a great convention, a lot of fun. Um, Salt Lake City was actually really nice. The weather was perfect, and this year was a little different. We didn't have as many big name, you know, world class speakers there this time, but it was so much more of a a laid back, easy going convention. We were able to just talk to everybody and anybody. I spent very little time listening to the uh, speeches and uh, more time, you know, just uh, meeting people, and networking, and it was uh, a lot of fun. I hung out with Chris Cluey a little bit. Uh -huh. He was our keynote speaker. Uh, you know, I say that's also really important that we're starting to get some celebrities that are coming out, and it gets harder for people to hate. Like, you know, if you're a diehard football fan and you see a great punter up there, it gets a little hard to just, you know, you, were, you love this guy until he announced it. He's not a different person the day after he comes out as gay. He's just somebody that had the courage to do that. Well, he didn't actually come or out as gay. Or was he, he just, was he he just supporting the right for the He's supporting clubhouse? gay rights. Oh, I'm sorry. So, uh, but he was really smart, really funny, and very articulate. And uh, besides his uh, speech he gave, we were outside uh, on the day he left. We were debating with some of the protesters. Now, the moment Mormons did not protest us, but there were some local evangelicals who did. But they were all just such nice people. We got along. We all went out and got pictures with them and, and had a talk. But on the last day, uh, Chris Cluey and I and a couple of other people were having a, a debate with one of the local evangelicals there. And we were just all having a great time. Nobody was angry. Nobody had any reason to be angry. It was just a big, you know, round robin joke fest. It was uh, it's actually a lot of fun and okay. very entertaining. Yeah, I guess that's another important point that you make that, you know, most religious people, the individuals themselves, aren't nasty people. They're really just trying yeah. to get through life. They're doing their best. They're not out there, you know, to do hate. It's really, I guess what we have more an issue with is that some of the organized religion pushes some very, you know, hateful attitudes out there on the people. And that's just the humanity of the people that kind of resists that. Yeah. You know, I've said, and we've all said on this program many times, we are not trying to bash individuals here, but we do have problems with the religion. And, uh, you know, we realize, we recognize, we acknowledge that most people who are deeply religious in this country are trying to do the right thing. This is what they think is the right thing. They're trying to raise a family, you know, have a home, keep shelter over their heads, and just be good people. And, and most of these people have been taught since they were two and three and four years old that this is the right thing. Right. And it really takes a very active process to wean yourself off of faith and to realize that the best thing you can do for your children is to teach them how to think critically, right. not just to do what your parents did for you back before you know, science had exploded and we'd seen yeah. how helpful it was. We also uh, have said on here that these people are not really our problem. It's the worst elements of religion, the people who are actively, aggressively uh, trying to affect legislation and, uh, you know, to make it conform to biblical principles and to basically just increasingly uh, religionize the American legal system, the American political. Right, right. Process. Matthew, maybe we can get into that a little bit. We just had the National Day of Prayer this past week. Yeah. And again, you know, there's two specific elements. One is that we would like everybody to think more critically because it's just going to help you through life. There's another complete issue of separation of church and state, that if you believe in something and you're not out there inflicting harm on others, I'm very much at peace with you believing that. Mm -hmm. When you bring it into the government, it's a totally different issue. Yeah. Um, National Day of Prayer. Uh, yeah, I missed it this year. I was... <laughs> And it's being I'm combated by a national day of reason. We could compare right. what, what reason can offer and how it's expanded longevity and brings people out of poverty and all things that you can do through rational thought versus what prayer has achieved in 2,000 years. Yeah, right. Uh, national day of prayer. Uh, you know, you got to wonder, what would Jesus say about the national day of prayer? Fortunately, we have uh, some words from alleged words from the alleged Jesus, his own alleged self. From Matthew 6, verses 5 and 6, it says, 
And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. That would seem to be, the National Day of Prayer would seem to be antithetical to these uh, uh, direct words from uh, the alleged creator of the universe. Yeah, it would seem so. Uh, the, the other thing to remember is that this isn't just open to religions of all. I mean, that's how it's, how it's passed off, that this is really just for everybody. Yeah. But here in America, this is really just another way to push a uh, Christian agenda exactly. into the government. Um, one thing I want to point out is, and we usually think of you know, the GOP, God's own party, it's usually a big source of this problem. Um, a Democrat, uh, Representative Janice Hahn, who stormed out of the National Day of Prayer because she was stunned by James Dobson's attack on President Obama. Now, you know, James Dobson of the you know, spare the rod, spoil the child, right. um, certainly is not anybody that I'd be looking to defend. But the big problem here is that what did she expect? Once you introduce religion into the government, you know, there's been sectarian fighting for centuries. And it shouldn't be a surprise to her as a sophisticated woman that Dobson's up there saying these terrible things. She should be protesting religion and government, not just the fact that some religious right. zealot is not, saying not, nasty things. Not the fact that James Dobson did pretty much what you could expect from James Dobson. Uh, all I can say to James Dobson is focus on your own family, James, <laughs> and leave the rest of us alone. But yeah, it, it just points out the difficulty, the, the, the problem with having a national government-sponsored day of prayer. Yeah. I mean, it's contrary to the uh, Constitution. It's contrary to good sense, and it just, it's just an unnecessary source of friction. And then when you go and claim that our founders would have supported this when they went so far out of their way to create a secular yeah. government. Well, what our founders did do, what they would have done and what they actually did do may be two different things because when they wrote the Constitution, they put in uh, two explicit prohibitions which apply only to religion. And one of them is government can't be a champion for religion in any way. The other one is no religious test, of course. In right, you, and you look at that now, and you know, again, uh, Democrats are certainly not blameless. They are, you know, even President Obama was speaking about the National Day of Prayer, and he didn't uh, yeah. come out talking about reason and common sense. Um, but there is a litmus test in a lot of these GOP primaries where you have to come out against evolution. You Gotta have to want to teach evolution. creationism yeah. in school. And what is the state of our democracy? When well, we're at that. you know, and it shows up in the way the, the uh, Republicans treat science when they load the science committee in the House of Representatives of the United States of America in the 21st century with young earth creationists. This is, this is appalling beyond words. So, when we saw this back with George Bush, took a lot of people that were anti-abortion and therefore that qualified them for all sorts of political yeah. and scientific posts. Yeah. But I guess the real important message is it's not just George Bush. This is still going on. You know, we, religion and government are getting so integrated, and we really need to do something to pull them apart. Right. So, so National Day of Prayer, they should definitely put a stop to that, but I expect we'll be seeing that from here on out. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, last bit of news I want to talk about. We we're going to do this as a skit, but we eventually decided it just wasn't so funny, and so we're going to present it straight, was that John Roberts' Supreme Court kind of declared a little while ago that racism is essentially dead in America, and therefore we may as well just gut the Voting Rights Act. Well, we saw this week that that wasn't true. Right, and it turns out racism and bigotry aren't dead. Um, we've seen racism. Clive and Bundy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Clive and Bundy and... Um, right, and then Donald, Sto Donald, right, Donald Sterling. Donald Sterling. Um, not too favorable about blacks, and Bundy, I think, was trying to say how the blacks had it better off when they were back picking cotton instead of picking up Medicaid checks, and just couldn't understand yeah. why that was a racist yeah, remark. What's, what's all the uproar about, you know? Right, um, you know, and, and again, it's not... Just, you know, there's a couple of aspects to this. One is critical thinking skills, which we can get back to in a little bit. Yeah. But it's also important to remember that we had Trent Lott was uh, waxing nostalgic over uh, Strom Thurmond, you know, segregation. Absolutely. Yeah. And then uh, Ted Cruz Ted was Cruz. wishing that we had 100 Jesse Helms to stock the Senate. Right. And these are, you know, Rick Perry couldn't be reached for comment because he's off at Niggerhead Lodge, the family getaway. Right, right. So, you know, it's really crazy to act like. We don't have racism here. We have literally millions of minorities and democratic skewed voters who are being purposely disenfranchised. 
mm -hmm. you know, in, in the name of a handful of alleged voter frauds. And, and if I may say, there is, uh, to bring it back home, there is certainly biblical justification for much racism and, you know, cultural hatred of other cultures, other tribes not your own. Right, right. And, you know, like anybody can be a nasty person. You can have a nasty yeah. atheist. But when you get religion and you take your sacred texts literally, it really pushes you towards some of these nasty well, conclusions does. about blacks and about women and about slavery is actually, you know, justifiable. And, and while uh, racism wouldn't seem to be our obvious mission, it clearly is part of uh, what religion and illogical thought, you know, non-skeptical thought permits it's a way that it permits us to act in ignorance. Right, and, if, you know, and that's some of the power of the scientific method and skeptical thinking is we all come into, the, you know, into this with cognitive bias and we're all gonna mm -hmm. tend to favor our own in-groups. And with the scientific method, it lets us try to get some kind of objective sense. And the further back you can pull, you can see that disenfranchising millions of people, maybe that doesn't seem so fair, or that putting people in cages, maybe that doesn't seem so fair objectively, even though well, yeah, it's not fair, and uh, what people need to realize is that this is the only planet we got. Nobody can leave here and go to another planet for disagreeing or being the wrong race or whatever. We all live here. This is the only place we have to live. We're going to have to learn to get along instead of this crazy racism and race baiting that's yeah. going on now. All right. All right. Well, we're going to come back. We're going to take a break for just a couple of minutes, and we're going to come back with Robin Blumner and talk about reason. Okay. The Madras High Court in the South Indian state of Tamil Nadu has ruled that a woman who converted from the Nadar Hindu, a member of a protected caste known as a backwards class, may retain her welfare benefit status certification under the Indian caste system after converting to Labai Islam, another protected class. In the Indian social system, the lower caste people are termed backwards classes under Indian law. While in the past, the people in these castes were socially shunned and discriminated against, today the Indian government offers these lower caste people benefits and affirmative action in hiring to help improve their quality of life. A petition was filed with the court by one Miss M.U. Arafa after she was denied once for government employment as a village administrative officer in 2012, and then later again for position as a fire department station officer. In both cases, Arafa met the qualifications for the positions which are required by law to be filled with a person of her social caste. Madras High Court Justice Hari Paranthaman ruled on the petition calling the Tamil Nadu Backward Class Commission, charged with overseeing the welfare of the protected BC communities in that state, responsible. The TMBCC has taken the position that the caste status only applies to those born into Muslim families and not to individuals who converted to Islam, as petitioner Arafa had done. The judge called removing Muslims from their protected caste status in this way as tantamount to depriving them of their human rights. The High Court Justice ordered the government of Tamil Nadu to appoint Ms. Arafa to either of the positions for which she is qualified with all the seniority due her as a BC Muslim from the time she became so qualified. Several blogs and minor news agencies recently reported on remarks delivered to an Oklahoma gun advocacy group by Rafael Cruz, the evangelical preacher father of Texas Senator, presidential hopeful, and Tea Party darling Ted Cruz. The senior Cruz was a featured speaker last November at OK2A, a Second Amendment Advocacy Association. During his speech, Rafael waxed on his own personal thoughts as to how to handle the problem of the godless, as he termed it in which he said leads to child molestation and perversity. Said Cruz, it's a free country. If these people need to practice their holy rites of atheism, they can do so as long as they're in clearly marked encampments far away from the rest of us. While they're in their heathen zones, they're free to dance naked around the fire, brand the mark of the devil on their flesh, or whatever else they want to do. Of course, if they step one foot outside the electric fence, we shoot them between the eyes. Two or three times just to make sure. And I will show you wonders in heavens above and signs in the earth beneath. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. This biblical passage from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 19 and 20, is the basis for a pronouncement by Pastor John Hagee, 
that the recent lunar eclipse heralds the beginning of the realization of end times prophecy. For their part, scientists call the occurrence of four consecutive lunar eclipses at six month intervals a tetrad and suggested that they are not altogether uncommon occurrences given the likely age of our lunar satellite. Assuming that the end times do not occur, there are expected to be nine sets of tetrads before the 21st century ends. According to Hagee, however, the world is destined to end as we know it by October of next year. Hagee has even published a book spelling out his eschatology titled, Four Blood Moons, Something is About to Change. The book's description reads in part, It's rare that scripture, science, and history align with each other, yet the last three series of four blood moons have done exactly that. This is Richard Dawkins. Doing commercials is unfamiliar territory for me, but I'm inviting you to watch Road to Reason, a skeptic's guide to the 21st century on Fairfax Public Access every Sunday. Each week the hosts tackle wishful thinking, religion, pseudoscience and the harm they cause with a combination of facts, humor and community involvement. They challenge believers to defend their faith and give you, the skeptic, a voice. With live call-ins for viewers and streaming on the World Wide Web, there's never a dull moment. Don't wait. Look at them now on Facebook and YouTube. And remember to watch Road to Reason, a skeptic's guide to the 21st century. Or there'll be hell to pay. We are back with Robin Blumner, the new executive director of the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science. Robin, when you joined back in February, did they let you ease into your post, or have you been a little crazy for the last couple months? It has been a, a crazy ride. Uh, I, I started the job February 5th, and as of March 31st, I was starting a two-week uh, cross-country tour with Richard Dawkins. It was phenomenal, incredibly successful, but boy, was you know what was I in for something? I, I I've done a lot of jobs, but I've never been. Uh, I've never been required to organize a two-week tour with about six weeks lead time. So I'll try to go through all of the cities we were in in, in two weeks' time, if I can remember. So we went from San Diego to Las Vegas to Phoenix to Austin to Columbus, Ohio to Miami, Florida to uh, Connecticut to Boston to Raleigh, North Carolina to Des Moines, Iowa and to Chicago. So you're single-handedly supporting the airline industry? Well. <laughs> Not a single lost bag, I want you to know, which is pretty amazing. But uh, there were a variety of activities. Some of them were arranged by me and the organization, and some of which had already been previously established. Uh, we, we had three Unbelievers movies events. So uh, what that is, uh, it's a documentary. Uh, two young documentarians, uh, Gus and Luke Holwerda, uh, followed Richard Dawkins and Lawrence Krauss, the astrophysicist from mm -hmm. Arizona State, who's also a, a pretty renowned non-believer himself, uh, around the world on their speaking engagements, took, took footage and then made a, a really excellent documentary out of it, which included some remarkable Hollywood stars, sort of either uh, adding their promoter, imprimatur to the idea of reason and science, or, or actually to non-belief, um, including Woody Allen, Cameron Diaz, Bill Pullman. It was, it was pretty remarkable to And how the audience has been reacting to it so far? So it was, it was fantastic. Uh, we, had, we had three events. One was in San Diego, one in Las Vegas, and one in Columbus, Ohio. <coughs> they were at the largest venues on the college campuses of those respective cities. Uh, 2,000 seat stadiums, ar ar arenas, um, <coughs> almost sold out in, in Ohio, about three quarters sold out in San Diego and Las Vegas. In Las Vegas, we had a, the comedian Penn Gillette of Penn and Teller mm -hmm. hosting the event. He emceed it and took questions afterwards, and he was hysterical. <coughs> but I think, I think that what was really the most fun for me was 
after the event itself, where the movie would be shown, and then on stage would be Richard, Lawrence, and the filmmakers to answer <coughs> questions. After that, uh, Richard and Lawrence would sit behind a, a desk, basically, or, or a table, and people would come up with books that Richard had written or, or Lawrence had written to get signatures. The, the line would be an hour long, an hour long, and these were almost entirely young people, college students. And every third or fourth young person would come up to Richard Dawkins and say, you changed my life. I, re I read we, We've God heard Delusion. that a lot from various guests that we've had on that he really has made an impact. I read, and it wasn't just the God Delusion that did it, although that was, I think, the preeminent choice. But The Selfish Gene, or The Greatest Show on Earth, or one of his remarkable uh, evolutionary biology books also would be the catal catalyst for someone to sort of wipe the mythology away and finally understand the way the natural world works with, a criti with critical thinking, just what you were talking about in the, in the intro, the idea that, um, that only through the application of the scientific method do we really understand our world? Mm -hmm. And so they've been brought up with you know, dogma and, and mythology and the supernatural. And some of, them, some of them came to understand how wrong that was by reading The God Delusion, which kind of attacks it four square. Right. But some of them came to it through <coughs> just simply, simply appreciating that the rightness mm -hmm. of evolution. Well, Lawrence Krauss had a funny comment, or not funny, but he was talking about you know, he doesn't, atheism wasn't the big thing for him exactly. It's, you know, the, the beauty of science and how, you know, how great it is. And that it just never comes up in the scientific conventions, is there a god? So you have 97% of the top elite scientists don't believe in all this magical stuff. But it just doesn't, it isn't an issue for them. And I think the more scientifically literate we can get as a culture, a lot of people are going to start coming around to this. And so whether it's through Richard Dawkins, that frontal attack, or just starting to see the beauty of science and how skeptical thinking what it leads us toward. But yeah. um, you know, I can't wait to see the... See the it seems like a lot of kids in school anymore don't, or they miss the day when they're told that science is how we understand what is real in the universe. It's very it's, scary, it, that, that especially is. now with uh, vouchers in so, introduced in so many states, including the state I came from, Florida, where public money basically is underwriting uh, Christian indoctrination indoctrination, actually any religious indoctrination, but these schools are largely either Catholic or Christian in one way or another. And, uh, and our tax dollars are going to support that. Uh, and it's sadly passing constitutional muster in the courts. Um, the, I, I think you're, you, you, know, you don't expect that the kids that graduate with, an, with a science education that does not include a thoroughgoing knowledge of evolution, they're not going to be the future scientists. They're not going to be medical doctors. Right. They'll you be know. the future apologists that know enough about science to use some words without really getting how science works. Exactly. I did want to mention one thing about the, the tour because it was really fun uh, traveling with Richard Dawkins. And he's such an eloquent spokesperson for skepticism. But he's also an incredibly well-rounded intellectual. And when there would be a test, uh, a mic test, to get the level, he would, he would just launch into memorized poetry, you know, Shelley, Keats, Lord Tennyson, just things he had right at his disposal to offer up. And it was, you know, of course, so eloquent. And he has that mellifluous voice that makes almost everything he says, even ordering a sandwich in a deli, uh -huh. sound brilliant. Yeah, my accent's not so not so good. <laughs> Even our commercial he did for us here was uh, just uh, beautifully done. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I've been thinking about getting a British accent myself. Yeah, I, my, where can I really, buy one of those? Yeah, that's they, not they really of, work. That's not one of my talents. Um, yeah. Do you want to jump into maybe we're we're going to mostly spend the day talking about what you've done in the past since you're pretty new at the Dawkins Foundation, um, but maybe you can tell us about the openly secular campaign that you're working on right now. Yes, this is the most exciting initiative of the Richard Dawkins Foundation. Uh, we're going to probably be spending almost half our budget on this effort to get atheists, agnostics, humanists, free thinkers, however you define yourself, to uh, be vocal about who they are. And we've already hired a, uh, a national public relations firm to do focus group uh, polling, 
research, so it's qualitative and quantitative research, in determining sort of what is the general feeling out there toward not unbelievers, uh, who, who might be our targets for a campaign like this, who may be our allies, because of course we just don't want people who are, are already skeptics to join our campaign. We want people who are religious, who understand that it's wrong to discriminate, that we should have a society that respects the separation of church and state, and that everyone gets to hold their own belief or non-belief and be treated decently in society. You shouldn't have to worry about your job going away or your business being undermined. Uh, your, you shouldn't have to worry about not being elected for political office. If, if you decide you're willing to be truthful that you reject the supernatural and you subscribe to an evidence-based view of the natural world. And yet that is the condition of, of modern American society. And so what this, what this uh, openly secular campaign is, is we're doing, we're going around the country to various conferences. We're getting, um, we're getting videos of average, everyday, ordinary people. Like and, and we met at uh, American Atheist Convention in Salt Lake City two weeks ago, and you were doing this. You had an area set aside, and you were actively getting people, as many people as possible, to come explain their, their secularism, how they arrived at atheism. Right. And we, this will be a campaign launched in September, and what we're going to do is we're going to ask just average everyday Americans who are non-believers to say out loud their, their demographics. For instance, they'll say, you know, I'm, I'm married, I've been married to the same man for 24 years, I ha have fantastic parents that live in Manhattan, I am a, you know, an attorney, or, or even better, we have people who have come from the military background or who are police officers or firefighter, firefighters, and they'll say, you know, I'm the guy that runs into a burning building when you're running out. Uh, I'm the dad of two kids. I coach soccer on the weekends, and I'm an atheist. Right. And, I guess know. it gets harder to hate secularists and atheists when you realize that they're the doctors and the teachers and the nurses and the firemen and all the people that, you know, your friends and the people that help you out all the time. It, well, it really is t essentially taking a page from the gay and lesbian movement and how they were able to go from a really social outcasts to largely accepted and embraced and very soon, you know, a widespread acceptance of gay marriage probably nationwide within the next year or two. Uh, they did that by making sure that no one could say, well, I don't know anyone who's gay. Right. <laughs> they made sure that everyone knew someone gay and largely liked them, trusted them, enjoyed their, them as coworkers, enjoyed them as, as uh, neighbors, you know. And yeah, so, I mean, and it's the same, the same is true as, oh, look, atheists make up, uh, uh, people who are willing out loud to say they're atheist or agnostic make up nearly 6% of the U.S. population. That's, that's way... That's talking like almost 20 million people, roughly. That is significantly more than the number of people who self-identify as Jewish or Muslim mm -hmm. or Buddhist in the United States. And yet, we are... We have no political representation. Right. And then when you think about... I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, uh, on Openly Secular, are you going to be doing any more of these videotaping sessions anywhere? We, we are. So the American Humanist Association Conference, which is in Philadelphia mm -hmm. in early June, I'll mm -hmm. be there doing uh, more of these videos. But I'm not the only one. And an important thing to know is that this is not just a Richard Dawkins Foundation initiative. So uh, the Secular Coalition for America, the Secular Student Alliance, and the Todd Stiefel's uh, Family Foundation, all we're, we are acting as a, as a single unit, as a single group, to get uh, this this launched in September. We hope we'll bring some some Hollywood celebrities on board at some time down the road. We'll see, and uh, it's going to be a sophisticated campaign to change the way America thinks about. Unbelievers. And hopefully, uh, as more people, the people who are sitting silently in the pews or wherever, who have abandoned or lost their belief in uh, God or any of the gods, um, this is a way to show them that there are people out here like them who have been through this who are here to support them. And we want, we want religious leaders also to join us. This is not an effort to push people away or to convert them in any way. Uh, 
We want religious people to say they believe in equality for skeptics, that they believe in the separation of church and state, that's an important principle that this nation was founded upon, and that they will, st they will stand side by side with their atheist and agnostic friends and neighbors. Right. We had uh, Rob Boston was on the show a few weeks ago, and he's worked with um, Reverend Lynn for over a couple of decades now, and it's really important to realize that there are you know, huge amounts of progressive religious people that really are just trying to do right. And there's ministers and reverends that are out there fighting for secularism, that they understand you know, we need to separate government, and you know, it, it works for both religious people and for the atheists. And, and when you spend much time down at the Supreme Court, which we have the benefit of doing whenever there is an event which touches us, you know, the uh, Supreme Court, we go down there uh, with our signs and everything and get as many people as we can on a weekday. And one thing you'll always find is lots of religious people who do agree with us on separation of church and state. I mean, if Barry Lynn is not enough of an example, but uh, there, there's a lot of support for it out there. And I, I know that personally when I'm in an argument slash debate with somebody that's not going anywhere, the one thing I like to do is end it on an agreement that separation church and state is a good thing, that everybody can believe whatever they want to, and you can't kill anybody for saying different than you. So, right. And what could be fairer than that? Where on this planet do you get a better deal than that? Sadly, though, the courts are being less friendly <clears throat> toward that doctrine. And we have a U.S. Supreme Court, which is now um, in the majority, a conservative court. And Catholic. With, you know, Right, uh, although there, although I understand that, but there's at least one of them, Sonia Sotomayor, who will not... Who, well, she's who, the sixth Catholic. Uh, oh. She's the sixth one. The other five that vote together are all Catholics. No, I don't... I don't I'm pretty sure. Is is Clarence Thomas Catholic now? I believe he is. Because I thought he was born we'll, we'll into fact, Southern... Fact, we'll we fact, will fact check it. We have five, be, five people on the, on the right wing of the... But they're definitely six spectrum. Catholics. Yeah. And Sotomayor is the only one, I believe the votes with the liberal bloc. Yes, that would be true, right. Okay. Yeah, and it's scary. Uh, I, I, I think there are going to be new incursions into church-state separation that are affected by this court down the road. And so that makes the political arena even more important. That makes changing the viewpoint of Americans toward skeptics and agnostics and atheists even more vital because if we don't have the courts, which was sort of our last refuge in, in many ways, uh, we, we're gonna be lost. We'll be a much more religiously driven nation from a public policy standpoint unless we can change the way people think about atheists so that we can run for office without being uh, automatically excluded on the basis of our non-belief. Yeah, you know, maybe you can jump into talk about activism a little bit. like coming out and at least saying, yes, I'm an atheist or I'm secular is one thing. Really devoting your life to making people understand the benefits of skepticism and science is another. You know, how do you see activism? How important is it that people really understand that we need to engage the, com the country and make things happen for the better? It's not just going to drift towards you know, progressive tendencies. Well, and, and that's a little bit a uh, part of the problem when we try to compare ourselves uh, to the gay and lesbian movement. So. So gays and lesbians came out of the closet. It was incredibly dangerous for them to do so. Uh, early on, they jeopardized their jobs, their family relationships, their standing in the community. But the only way they could live their lives as their biology intends is for, their, is for people like them to come out and, and for society and culture to change to be more welcoming for them. For, for the godless amongst us, you know, it's, it's not quite as essential. We can go along pretty well just keeping our atheism to ourselves. Uh, we don't necessarily have to challenge the status quo by being out there vocal and courageous. So it, it's, I think it's going to take a little bit more to get people to be more comfortable about being public, especially, I mean, it's one thing to come out, you know, and, and talk about your atheism or agnosticism in, in Boston or Chicago or, or San Francisco, right. you know, you just, people are going to give you a big shrug, but try to do that in, in Birmingham, 
in, in Pensacola, Florida, uh, you know, yeah. in Decatur, Georgia, and you, you could possibly be putting yourself at physical risk. Yeah, you know, it used to be highly lethal on this planet, even in this country, to be a non-Christian. And uh, I'm fond of saying that we were hunted with dogs for 1,500 years, so there's a lot, still a lot of lingering uh, bad press about but us. The point is that, that it's going to be hard, I think, uh, harder to get people to come out and be public about their secular views because the impetus is not there for, right. for us the way it, it, is, it was for, for the gay and lesbian movement. That said, I, I want to try to convince people that it is essential, that you know, the reason that our, our politics are often dominated by people who, who want to limit stem cell research or who deny climate change, people who want to prevent girls from getting comprehensive sex education, who want to deny abortion rights to adult women to make a choice for themselves between themselves and their doctor. I mean, the, those are real life consequences to allowing religion to dictate public policy. And so there, there's a, an essentialness to coming out for, for agnostics, atheists, and non-believers too. It just, it's just a little more remote. It's not quite as personal. And no. also, as, as we see things spiral like global warming, are we gonna wait until civilization is in decay before we finally say, okay, magical thinking doesn't work. It really doesn't work in politics. You know, atheism is just an outgrowth of skeptical thinking about religion. You know, we all need to be skeptical thinkers about all facets of our life. And yeah, I don't know if there's a way to, how we can quickly get the whole atheist community to understand we need everybody coming out really quickly. And then there's a certain mass and it makes it easier and safer for everybody else. But you know, the, it, the reality is the first people that poke their heads up, they can get them locked yeah, off. Yeah, exactly. And so it, and it still requires a certain amount of bravery to do that. The worse, the deeper you were immersed in it, coming in, the harder it is to get out of it. But there's bravery and then there's bravery. Uh, you want to talk a little about the Nicole Hatch case? So when in my prior iterations, one of my f former jobs was as the director of the American Civil Li Liberties Union for the state of Florida. And early on in my tenure as ACLU director, there was a young girl named Nicole Hatch. Uh, she was a fifth grader at a school in Nassau County, Florida, which is uh, northeastern Florida. I used to joke that the that you know the north of Florida was the deep south, and the south of Florida was Central America, which you know in some ways it was. Um, so Nicole uh, was upset because her teacher would spend a bit of time every day reading from from the Bible. She would, the, the teacher would read a Bible passage every day to the classroom, and. Nicole told her parents, her parents were very upset, so they complained to the school, and the, the answer of the school to this little girl who didn't want someone else's religion shoved down her throat on a daily basis was to put a chair in the hallway of her classroom where she would be sent to during the Bible reading so that she wouldn't have to listen to it. Well, if you know, if that doesn't al cause alienation, that that doesn't put you in line for extensive bullying, I don't know what does. Exactly. You know, no one, none of those kids should have been exposed to a religion lesson of that kind, an indoctrinating lesson on a daily basis. And, and never and, mind that was outlawed in 1963 in, uh, was it Kurtzman case? It was the same time as very Murray v. Curlett. Yeah, the Lemon Medicare. versus Kurtzman. That no, I'm sorry, it wasn't oh. the Lemon case, uh, not the Kurtzman. It was another one. I'll think of it in a minute. Uh, anyway, the so reading. the ACLU sued uh, on on her behalf, our parents' behalf, and eventually reached a settlement. And of course, the the Bible reading had to end. But you know, the, you the uh, Thomas Jefferson said, "Eternal vigilance is the price of liberty," and those fights just never go away. Ultimately. Uh, so if you're not fighting in the public schools, you're fighting against a voucher system, which Florida adopted and now uses throughout the state, to, um, to underwrite uh, religious education with public dollars. And so there, these kids are getting you know, chapter and verse every day, all day, and 
there's nothing you can legally do about Abington it. Abington v. Shemp was the 63 uh, Shemp, case that right? outlawed Shemp. Bible reading where Murray v. Curlett was the prayer part. Both those cases came down at the same time. Okay. So. Yeah. yeah, I think that's an important point about the whole voucher system that people don't really realize what it means because it's put out there as we need a better education, we need to help our kids and this current system isn't working so let's do vouchers. It's not really floated as we on the religious right want to get Christianity back into the schools and this is a sneaky way to do it. It is and it's so disingenuous because what, what ends up happening is uh, they, they sell it as though it's a way for poor kids to have another choice in, in education and they are able to enlist poverty stricken parents who don't like the public school they've been assigned to. So the, the perniciousness of the Christian right is using as sort of a pawns these kids who really do deserve a better education, uh, using them for the purposes of, of the, the camel's nose under the tent, uh, getting, getting the public to pay for religious education. Because what private schools exist out there that will take a, a voucher of, let's say, Three to five thousand dollars, whatever it is, they're parochial schools or they're Christian-run mm -hmm. schools. Yeah, sure. Now, I'm going to get back. So, in addition to working for the ACLU, before that, you were a labor lawyer in New York. Yes, um, I started. I started my career. Uh, I went to Cornell University and then NYU Law School. Uh, right after law school, I was a labor lawyer in New York. I worked for a branch of the New York City Transit Authority as an assistant director of labor relations. But I will tell you that my my deep sensibility and passion always lied with the union side of the labor movement, and eventually I had designs on moving into that. But while I was working for the New York City Transit Authority, I started volunteering at night as a law clerk for the Reproductive Freedom Project of the ACLU. And that was the arm of the national ACLU that protected abortion rights and birth control access and the things that, that I cared quite deeply about at the time and still do. Um, I was doing tremendous work with that, or with that project. Uh, not only was I writing pieces of briefs that would go to appellate courts and even to the Supreme Court, but I, I did this one really interesting project, which was that every door on, it, within the project, every doorway had a sign on it and it said, get power. <coughs> Powell, Lewis Powell was on the court at the time and he was the swing vote for the sustenance the maintain, to maintain Roe versus Wade as good law. And so every brief had to be written to appeal to Lewis Powell's sensibilities. And so one of the things that I did as a volunteer was to read through everything that he'd ever written. His, his opinions, his dissents, his concurrences, but also any speeches he gave, anything he wrote as a young man. And I uh, analyzed it all and synopsized it down into sort of nugget form where, where the project could literally write a brief using his own words. And that helped, you know, to, to be as as persuasive as possible to so, so what do you vote think, on the court. What, what do you think about all the end runs now that we're seeing to get rid of women's access to women's clinics? You know, if they can't get rid of it constitutionally, they can shut down every clinic so a woman has to travel 400 miles <coughs> to get reproductive care. Well, it's absolutely sickening. It's, there's, there's no excuse for it. I mean, it really is a kind of dark ages mentality where women who have won this constitutional right can't actually access those services because they've figured, because the courts have allowed, the federal courts have allowed these kinds of slow, erosive incursions into the right of, so that these clinics have to meet impossible and expensive standards in order to keep their door, doors open. Women have to go through um, unnecessary procedures, waiting periods, or they have to, have to ultrasound before they get an abortion. You know, it's as though you don't think a huge majority, probably 99.9% .9 of women who are considering having an abortion haven't thought it out fully. Haven't thought fully. it through, yeah. Right. You know, have, have. Well, that's have a group of white men going to room make the decision for the 150 million <laughs> women it, in America. I don't know why any woman stands for it, really. Why any woman would vote for someone who's not on their side. 
it really, the Phyllis Schlafly's of the world and the others like her, I don't get it. How could they, even if they don't want to use it themselves, how could they betray all other women who might have, you know, whatever reason? Well, uh, and of course, the, the, she only cares about uh, ch a child until it's born. Or right. People like her. I mean, I don't want to just point her finger at her. I don't. I don't know. Maybe she actually is quite a generous person to in, in, in charities for for children. But largely, the same people who are making sure that women have limited access to their to abortion services and other reproductive um, options. Or to contraception so they don't or need abortions eventually. They're, they're the ones who, who are also making sure that you know, universal health care doesn't exist, that food stamps are cut, that uh, unemployment, long-term unemployment insurance doesn't exist. You know, all the things that would make lives for these children easier and, is, and is, is, is the kind of thing that, that people who support, who claim to be pro-life are typically against. And, and this renewed uh, campaign from the, the 19th century that women don't even belong in the workplace. I mean, they're just saying it from the right, they're just saying it out loud like it's not even insane. I would have thought when I started working with the Reproductive Freedom Project in 1985 or 86 that by this time, abortion would be a non-issue. Non Especially after RU-486, you know, it became, uh, it became possible to get an abortion through a doctor's office using a pill form, at least in the early stages. And it's just the opposite. Right. I mean, yeah. a big part of the argument is, uh, you know, visually they can show here's a really developed fetus. It's at, you know, 34 weeks. These are the atheists are killing these. But the reality is we can stop this when it's down to, you know, stopping the cell from implanting. And that's no good either. So it really does boil down to the magical thinking that there's a soul and that you're violating God's will by a woman taking control of her, her life and her reproductive freedom. Well, yeah, the very idea that emergency contraception uh, morning after pill is a, a, form of is murder. a, a chemical yeah. abortion and a form of murder. It, you know, you're talking about a, a, a group of cells that's smaller than, than the brain of a fruit fly, mm -hmm. a, basically, a blastocyte. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of women actually think that uh, Plan B is a gift from God. <laughs> and rape pregnancy, not so much. Yeah. All right, um, I want to get to one other thing. So you are also a uh, nationally syndicated writer um, at the Tampa Bay Times. An actual journalist. An actual journalist. I was, and I yeah, saw that you were uh, nominated for a Pulitzer <clears throat> Prize finalist, so you're fairly I, good at that. I was a Pulitzer finalist along with some colleagues for editorial writing mm -hmm. uh, in 2012. And, and yeah. I, I saw somebody that was talking about your columns and that as that columnist, you really had a profound influence on like the judges that might get appointed. Like you really used some critical thinking as people were trying to get their posts. Maybe you can tell us what you miss about uh, that and what you did as a journalist. So I was a, a columnist and editorial writer at the Tampa Bay Times, formerly the St. Petersburg Times. It, it changed its name a couple of years ago. Uh, and I, I did that from 1997 until, I, until February 5th, basically, uh. a few weeks before that. Uh, I was syndicated nationally by Tribune Media Services out of Chicago. I was in newspapers around the country. My column was. But the work that I did with the judges, with the judiciary, was with the editorial board. We, every, every time there was a, an election where either county or circuit judges were up for election, because in Florida the system was kind of bifurcated. The, uh, the, the appellate court and the Florida Supreme Court were appointed posts, and the, the, the trial court, the county and the circuit courts, they were elected. So I would do all of the, the due diligence, if you will. I mean, I would check into their background. I would talk to their former employers or their current employers. These would be candidates for the judiciary. Uh, you know, judges are very limited in terms of what they can say as a candidate for, for the bench. They, they really can't go into how they feel about certain, certain public policies because it might influence their uh, their decisions down the road. Mm -hmm. And so there are judicial canons of ethics that say candidates can really only give name, rank, and serial number and not much else. So for us to be able to, to recommend which candidate to, to vote for to the general public, 
I would, I would do all that background work, and we would, of course, interview the, ca the candidates themselves, and then we just decide which, which ones should get the nod. And because so few people knew, the, these were nonpartisan races, and you know, there wasn't a lot of information you could glean from just their resumes, uh, that there was a disproportionate number of people who would rely on the Tampa Bay Times' recommendation for judicial candidates. And, and we, we had a pretty good track record of choosing the winner. Yeah. Do, do you think that every candidate interviewed in that process should have to answer the question about young earth creationism? Well, again, you know, they, they, they would have to simply say that those kinds of views are not appropriate for disclosure. You know? They, but you know, they say that, but they say that as a stealth move. They don't want to admit it because it's embarrassing, and then they get in. I think it's important to press them on this issue. Well, and, and someone else would want to press them on whether they support the death penalty, and someone else would want to support them as to whether they're tough on crime. And you know, you, you really don't want judges to be taking sides as a way to get elected and it would ensure that when someone came before them, they wouldn't necessarily be evaluating the case on its merits. They would be using this prejudgment. So now we only have a couple minutes left. One last thing I wanted you to touch on is when you left that post as the liberal lioness, uh, you said it wasn't suddenly filled by another progressive; it just disappeared. Can you talk about where the media stands right now? And you know, Thomas Jefferson, Jefferson talked about needing an informed electorate to preserve democracy. So is media doing a good job, and where are things heading from here? I think you have to separate print journalism from the broadcast journalism and what goes on on the internet, uh, because uniquely print journalism has been uh, the, the leading edge of the fourth estate, the, the instrument that kept government and corporate America accountable, at least to some degree. And print journalism is is just on life support right now. It, it, there, nobody replaced me at the newspaper. The newspaper is shrinking, just like almost every newspaper in the country. Uh, it is very sad to see these vigorous institutions that are essential to our democracy wither, in part because people are not subscribing to newspapers anymore. They're not willing to financially uh, underwrite Pers being personally, civically informed. And it, there's the consequence of that is that we, you know, we're increasingly balkanizing our, our media consumption to only watch or listen to whatever agrees with us to begin with. You know, the print, okay. the print newspaper was an objective source of news and we're losing that. We're gonna need to cut it off there. Because right. we've got 10 seconds left. Well, Robin, thank you so much for coming with it. Um, we're going to have you back hopefully in a few months once you've been at the foundation for a while and they can tell us what's going on there. Let us know what's going on, you. what's right. new. Well, Thanks great. for coming on. Lots of fun. Thanks. Okay, check us out on Facebook. Like us if you like us, and we'll see you next week. Okay. Read your Bible.